Um, it's only now that I realised that I was giving my Christianity to my parents. Um, I now realise that God just wants to say, "Go oh, taste and see." That the Lord, yeah, the Lord is good. I had to experience it for myself. Yes. I couldn't live it through anybody else's uh, Christianity. Amen. Um, I was in church, and um, because I was living through my parents' Christianity, I strayed away from God. Bless him, Lord. Uh, but I believe God planted a seed in me. Amen. I had and had to go. Yes. And at the time, God called me back home. I remember that very clearly I was in a party where all the music was playing and the noise was going down. But yes. I hear God's voice very clear and precise yes. that it was time to come home. Praise God. And uh, the very next day, I gave my heart to the Lord and I've been experiencing Christ ever since. Amen. Yes. 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 God has been good to me. Um, my wife, is she going to be here today? But I have my so my daughter, and God has just been blessing us. Praise the Lord. Um, he is a good God. Yes, he is. Some writer says, how great is our God? And when you think about it, it's a question that you really don't want to answer. Because <laughs> as soon as you answer the question, you put a limit what? on God. God yeah. is this Yeah. You put a limit on God. And our God, God is greater yeah. than whatever we can ask or think of. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for Brother Justin, his uh, words today. Yes. And his PR exercise because it gives me confirmation that I'm bringing you today. I'm not preaching to you today, I just really want to speak with us. Um, and the topic is Jesus, the light of the world. And we uh, just been touched on God, Christ and us being the light. So I really want to try and elaborate, elaborate on that this morning. Amen. And the topic will be Jesus, the light of the world. And the passage of scripture that I would want to look at, and I'm going to take it to, to just look at some lessons that we can take from this passage of scripture yeah. and also look at, look at it from the perspective of evangelizing and witnessing to the last. So if you would have your if you have your Bibles with you, if you could turn to John 9 and we're going to be reading from 1 to 10. That's St. John Gospel of St. John chapter 9. Yes. Verse 1 to 10. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. And the scripture says, And Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. Yes. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Yes. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay um, of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Shaddam, which is interpreted, or interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seen. The neighbours therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged. Some said, This is he, others said, He is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? Here is the reading of God's holy word. In this passage of scripture, it appears that Jesus, I'll just give you the background of the scripture. Um, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and we know that by um, making reference to the Port of Shalom. And he is in no longer in hiding after he had been thrown out of the temple by the Jews, the Jewish authorities, for claiming that before Abraham or before anybody else, he was. And the writer John intends to connect this passage of scripture with previous scriptures where Jesus reaffirms and re-established himself as being the light of the world. It is in this passage of scripture Jesus has an encounter with a blind man. And there's nothing new. Uh, there's nothing new here as Jesus has come across blind men before. We know that he came across, uh, came across a blind man named Bartimaeus, um, who said, Son of David, have mercy upon me, as he sat by the wayside. But this blind man had no name, had no identity according to the scripture. And it's interesting that we can draw many similarities from both of these encounters. But equally, and more importantly, we can draw um, some differences. 
yes. for both of these encounters. Yes, Lord. This signifies that just because you're in the same situation as somebody else, doesn't mean that your own deliverance will be the same. Amen. God can take a different path or route or process yes. for you to reach your deliverance. Yes. That's right. Here was a, a blind man in a state and a condition which was common in biblical times. Yes. Blindness seems to be more common in biblical times than it is today. Afflictions in those times were worse because people lived understandably in poorer conditions, yes. had very limited access to medical care. Yes. The suffering of this blind person or a blind person was made worse by the common belief that the affliction was due to sin. Yes. Because of the severe disadvantage, a blind person had the opportunity to earn a living. And because of this, they found themselves as beggars relying on the generosity of others. There were many causes of blindness in ancient, in ancient times, in biblical times. One could be born blind due to the development of defects. Um, one could have a thing called trachoma or leprosy. Yes. Or just because of old age, they became blind. Make no mistake about it, blindness paralyzes you. That's right. It isolates you. Yes. It causes you to live as an outcast. You become ostracized and destabilized. And this man was a man who was blind from birth. Yes. He was in a hopeless situation. Yes. Many people who we come across in our society, in our world today, are in hopeless situations. Yes. They might, might, might not be physically blind, but life has dealt them a severe blow. And they feel that they have, are in a situation which they cannot get out of. But the Bible tells us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Yes. But for this man today, his life was about to change as his hopelessness was on a collision course with hope. Amen. The possibility of the blind person being mistreated was recognized and forbidden by God. The law prohibited uh, the giving of misleading directions according to Deuteronomy or to do anything to cause the blind people or blind people to stumble. So the law offered them some protection, but ultimately it did not deal with the cause or address the actual cause of them being blind. I want you to bear that in mind. For what the Lord could not do, for he was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, yeah. and the sin condemned sin in the flesh, according to Romans 8 3. Yeah. The Lord is weak because it cannot save man, not because there is anything, not there, that there is anything wrong with the law, but because man is unable to live up to the expectations and requirements yeah. and deal with the real issue with man himself. Yeah. And so when the disciples came across this blind man, they asked the question to Jesus, yes. whose fault is it that this man is blind? Yes. Have his parents sinned? Did they break the law? What did his parents do to cause him to be blind? I wonder how many people ask themselves, whose fault is it that they're in the situation that they're in? Right. Whose fault is it that I'm single? Yeah. Whose fault is it that I lost my job? Whose fault is it that I'm in debt? Whose fault is it that I'm an addict? Whose fault is it? Amen. Do you know that we're living in a world where it's become a blame culture? Yes. And that's not just the world, but that has extended to the church. Yes. If somebody feels a sense of injustice, the first thing that they do is they want to blame somebody else. Yes. Whose fault is it? Is it the government's fault? Yes. Is it the workplace's fault? Yes. Is it the economy's fault? Yes. Whose fault is it? Yes. It has to be somebody's fault. Yeah, We've spent so much time and effort and energy trying to find out whose fault it is. While people are dying, we're still trying to find out whose fault it is. While people are still in sin, we're trying to find out whose fault it is. While people go hungry, we're trying to find out whose fault it is. There must always be somebody to blame. But Jesus said, it doesn't matter who is to blame. I'm not concerned with that. I'm not concerned with whose fault it is or who you would want to lay blame on. In fact, if you want to, you can make me the scapegoat. I've already become the sacrificial lamb. I've already paid the price. And I'm here to deliver, set free. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. That's right. And notice I'm here using two terminologies here. Bless him, Lord. Whose fault is it and who's to blame? Let's not get them twisted or let's not get them confused. Because sometimes you're blaming somebody whose fault is not actually it is. True. Sometimes we bring decisions upon ourselves. We make bad choices and make bad decisions of our own. And really 
it is our fault, but we're trying to blame somebody else. Very true. Very true. I would say that if we had the power to fix and solve any problem, if we could change any circumstance, if we could change anything that we have the, the power to come across, we would not be concerned with whose fault it is. That's true. We wouldn't be concerned with it, with it because we have the power to change it. And so in the approach of evangelizing and reaching the lost, we come across people who feel a sense of injustice against them. Yes. And yes, as a church, it is our duty to speak out against that. But what we must not become concerned with is who is to blame. In the scripture, Jesus doesn't get drawn into the blame game. When his disciples ask him whose fault it is and who's to blame, or, or who, who, who should lay the blame, he doesn't see it as a problem. He sees it as an opportunity. He says, it wasn't this man or his parents' fault is why he is blind. He is blind so that the works of God might be seen in him. Now I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on. Blind from birth. Yes. Can you imagine being blind from birth? Never seen the light of day. Never seen his family. Never seen the environment in which he lived in. Total blindness. Total darkness. It's a blackout. Yes. He's in a dark place and he's in a dark situation. Do you know that there are some people that we will come across who are in a dark place and dark situations? Yes. They are unable, no matter how hard they try, to get themselves out of it. Yes. They are paralyzed yes. in their darkness. Yes. If you notice, unlike the blind man at the wayside who shouts, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me, this man said nothing. He was blind. But the Bible never mentioned that he couldn't speak. Even when the disciples were arguing uh, whose fault it was or who was to blame, this man was silent. Never said a word. Now he out of him. So he was in darkness. He was in a dark situation and in a dark place. And he was silent. Yes. And it got me thinking that when we go out to evangelize, yes. there are people that we are going to come across who are suffering silently. Yes. Frustrated yes. silently. Yes. Angry silently. Yes. Depressed silently. Yes. Dying in their situation and in their darkness silently. Help us God. Mm. Bless the Lord. This is indicative of the times that we are living in. Yes. But their dark places kept them silent. Darkness, let me just deal with this for a second, is a, is a physical reality of a physical universe. Yes. Darkness is also a spiritual reality. Mm. It should be noticed that really darkness is the absence of light. That's right. Nobody walks into a room and says, can you turn on the darkness? That's right. You walk into a room saying, somebody turn on the light. That's right. Yeah. Darkness is the absence yeah. of light. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Light may be vision, but darkness is blindness. Yeah. Light may be virtue, but darkness is sin. Light may be wisdom, but darkness is ignorance. Yeah. Light may be comprehension, but darkness can be delusion. Darkness, light may be truth, but darkness may be false. Light may be the personification of goodness, darkness the personification of evil. Light may be quite simply day, darkness may be nothing more than night. Light is dark, or as the scripture puts it, God is light, and darkness is nothing, it's void, it's emptiness. God does not need the sun, the moon, and the stars to provide light. God is light, according to 1 John 5. And in him there is no darkness. Somebody asked the question, how could there be light on the first, second, and third day of creation 
when God never created the sun, the moon, and the stars until the fourth day, the answer is quite simple. God Himself was the light for the first three days. And God is seeking to recall us back to His marvelous light. Yes. And so the scripture tells us that Jesus anointed the man's eyes yes. by spitting on the ground and making a clay or an ointment. Now, many theologians will, will speculate over the reason as to why Jesus would use this method to heal the blind man. Yes. Spitting on the ground and using the clay of the ground to anoint the man and, 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 and smirge it or smear it over his eyes. Why would Jesus use that, that technique? Yes. Could it be that Jesus wanted to portray a picture of the gospel? Spitting is seen as an offence. It's crude, it's offensive, it's, yes. it's, it goes against a worldly decorum. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, it, you spit at somebody, somebody's not going to be very, very happy with you. Right, right. It's an offence. Yeah. Just like the gospel of Jesus Christ is an offence to some people. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to the saved it is the power of God. Yes. Could it be that Jesus was trying to show his deity, showing that he was fully man yet fully God? The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. So here Jesus is now using the same or similar method in order to heal the man. Showing that he's fully man, yet fully God. Could it be that he was proclaiming, proclaiming that he is Lord of the Sabbath? According to verse 14, this miracle occurred on the Sabbath day. And we know that it's not right for him to work on a Sabbath day. Making a clay was tantamount to almost making brick and using your hands to work. And Jesus was showing that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Yes. Could it be? Or does it show the extremes, the creativity, the risks in which we must take in order to bring people to Christ? Amen. Ordinary just won't do when we serve an extraordinary God. Yes. Amen. That's right. But, but there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. Because Jesus had anointed this man with his ointment. He had spread his over his eyes. And yet, the man had an experience with Jesus, he had an encounter with Jesus, but yet he wasn't healed. He, Jesus had touched him, he had come in contact with the blind man, but yet he still could not see. <laughs> in fact, actually, he was worse up than he was before because now, even if he could see, he had mud over his eyes. Are you, are you with me today? This got me thinking that can it be as Christians, can it be as Christians, even though we have an encounter with God and an experience with God, even as Christians, we can still be in a dark place. Yes, it's true. Yes, bless the Lord. <laughs> and if you notice, he was worse than what he was before. Not only was he blind, but now, even if he could see, the mud had blocked his vision. Yes. Mm. Help us, Lord. And, and sometimes, that is the reality in which we live in. But even though we're saying friends can turn on you, situations and problems now that were never a problem can now become a problem. Yes. Circumstances can become more exasperating what you're saying. Yes. These things can happen when you're saying it causes you to lose sight, to lose focus, yes. and you can end up in a dark yes. place. Yes. Yes. Even as Christians, in a dark place. Yes. But we miss something very important in the earnest uh, rise of the scripture that Jesus said in verse 3. He said, Neither have this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Yes. When the disciples were arguing over whose fault it was, uh, whether, it was whether it was his parents' fault to blame that he was blind, Jesus said it wasn't his parents' fault. But his blindness was so that the work of God may be made manifest in him. In other words, 
his blindness was for the glory of God. Wow. This blew my mind when I read the scripture. So it's not saying, it's not saying, sometimes you need to be in a dark place for God to get the glory. Mm. Is it saying that sometimes you need to struggle a bit or be struggling for God to get the glory? Sometimes you need to feel a sense of insecurity for God to get the glory. Is that, is that what he's saying? Is it true that sometimes you need to feel weak for God to get the glory? Oh wow. Now, yeah, now it makes sense because the Bible says that his strength is made perfect in weakness. Yes, okay. That's why we could never get out of the situation on our own. We were, we were trying to maneuver and manipulate situations and circumstances, but we don't realize that God has, 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 has orchestrated it so that you're in dust, in darkness, or in a dark place, so that He can get the glory. So while you're in it, you might as well praise Him while you're in it, because the same God that can get you in it can get you out of it. That's right. Amen. Romans 8, verse 18 says, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory of God that shall be revealed in us. Yeah. Other, words, other words, after you have been in a dark place, you will realize that the glory or the light of God yeah. cannot be compared to that dark place you were in. First yeah. Peter 5, 10 says, and after you have suffered a little while, yeah. or after you was in that dark place a little yeah. while, the God of all grace who have called you into eternal glory in Christ will himself restore you, confirm you, and establish you. Finally, Jesus says to the blind man, read the scripture now, Jesus said to the blind man, go and wash in the pool of Shalom, which is interpretation of the sins. After which the blind man was healed and made to see. Now it's coming down now. But I want to leave you with this. Yes, Lord, bless you. Jesus tells the blind man who was blind with mud on his face to go wash in a pool. Yes. yes. Wow. Now, when you read the scripture, Jesus never said to him, I want you to take three steps to the, to the left, That's right. four steps forward, oh. and you will reach the pool of Shalom. Yeah. Jesus just said, Go. Amen. Wow. Hey, he was yeah. blind. Sometimes you have to take a few steps in darkness before you see the light. 
Amen. In other words, you have to step out on faith. Yes. Mm. Help us, God. But here's the thing, man. God now, when He shines the light, yes. when His glory comes over you, He's going to make you laugh. Mm. Because what happens is, when light shines on darkness, it creates a shadow. When light shines on darkness, it creates a shadow. So that dark place or that thing that she was in was really just a shadow. When was the last time a shadow can hurt you? When was the last time a shadow could cause harm to you? Yeah, you know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That situation you was in, it was just a shadow. God. It can't harm you. Yeah. It can't hurt you. It was just a shadow. But in order for it to be a shadow, light has to shine on the world. Has to shine in the darkness. That's why God's going to make you laugh. Yes. Because now you realize, hold on, that wasn't no situation that I was in. That was just a shadow. I thought I was going to lose my mind. I thought I was going to die in that darkness. Yes. But all the while, it was just. It was just a shadow. It was just a shadow. And so God is calling us to go. In the name of Jesus, He is calling us to go. And I, and I, I want to I pray for somebody. I want to release somebody today. And you might say to me, Brother Mark, I'm in a real bad place right now. Yes. A real dark situation right now. Jesus. I don't know whether I can be dealing with anything right now going out to evangelize. We're a community church. Yes. This is what we've been called to do. This is what we have been called to do. Yes. But I don't think I'm ready right now. I want to release somebody this morning to go. Yes. Amen. To go. Take a step out in faith. Yes. And go. Help us, God. Help us, Jesus. It may be dark, but you must take those few steps in darkness yes. sometimes Amen. in order for you to come to the light. Amen. Amen. Help us, God. Jesus. Step out on faith yes. in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So if you will, you. if you will just come right now, those who need prayer, yes. in a situation that you think, Help us God. I can't take it no more. I need the light, the glory, the marvelous light of Jesus Christ Amen. to shine in my life. I want to pray with somebody this morning and release somebody in this morning. If the worship team would just come. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God is calling us yes. to go. Amen. Yes, Lord. You may not be able to see your way out of it, but He's calling us. To go. Amen. Even in our dark state and in our dark situation, yes. He is calling us to go. Yes, he is. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And even as you come, the healing process starts as you come. It starts as you come. It starts as you come. 